mentor in establishment labs, clinical trials. I was an Allergan uh, consultant from 2012 to 2015. I serve a number of roles that are pertinent to my role today, specifically a lymphoma author for uh, NCCN guidelines. But I would say first and foremost, my primary responsibility is to my patients uh, whose uh, trust and their safety they give me. We've treated uh, 64 uh, cases of breast implant ALCL at MD Anderson. And up on the uh, screen, I placed the uh, FDA 2019 numbers on the middle with the profile uh, numbers to one side and the MD Anderson tracking for the United States on the other. And we can see the average time to development of the disease is 8 to 10 years. We can see in, uh, we recognize unique and confirmed cases, 152 in the United States. And uh, the shortest time interval to the development of the disease from an implant is 2.2 years. Uh, we can see the most common presenting symptom is a delayed seroma, however, capsular contracture, uh, a mass, as well as an overlying skin rash have been uh, described. There is no testing or screening for asymptomatic patients. If we do look, we do see uh, uh, SMOOTH has been reported in uh, both profile and FDA, but it's important to note that no SMOOTH-only implant cases have been reported in any case report or case series to date. Um, there is an even mix of cosmetic and augmentation, an even mix of uh, silicone and saline, um, as well as augmentation and reconstruction. Now, I want to harp on, if, I, if you take one thing from my presentation, it's this idea of smooth. There is no pure smooth cases to date. If we look on the FDA website, which had 30, uh, it's important to note that they either had a mixed clinical history or no clinical history available for review. You'll see in your packets that you received uh, from the FDA that it says that there's case reports. There's no citation or reference on that line that there's case reports. So there is um, misidentified three um, manuscripts in the literature, one by Adams, 2015, one by Largent, 2012, one by Lazari, 2011, which are commonly mis um, uh, uh, written as smooth implant cases. I've included the pertinent paragraphs from the manuscripts showing that they are actually unknown device history, not smooth implant history. There is no smooth implant case, not in any uh, series, not any case report, not any case registry. There is, however, uh, cases uh, related to other implants, so tibial implant. One patient developing CD30 positive ALK negative around four different dental implants, a gastric lap band, a shoulder repair, a chest metaport. However, this is it. This is all of them. I will add two gluteal implants. You're right that the one out of USC was not diagnosed around the implant, but the second one out of Sao Paulo was diagnosed in periprosthetic fluid. Um, that case was actually a breast, textured breast implant placed into the gluteal pocket, interestingly enough. If we look around, we uh, formed a global physician network of physicians that understand this disease, that are tracking uh, confirmed unique cases in 35 countries. And you can see we recognize 427 OUS world cases, as well as 19 deaths around the world, uh, where we feel very comfortable that the pathology was known and that, we, and that these are unique cases. We recognize five deaths in the United States as well as 152, giving us approximately 578 cases worldwide that I feel comfortable in. I believe that the middle column answers, um, uh, Dr. Lee, your question, which is how does the MOD database break down by manufacturers? So we did a collaboration between MD Anderson and Jeanette Alexander of the FDA uh, in 2017, and we broke down the MOD database by manufacturer. Um, you can see Gary Brody's series in the first column and MD Anderson updated as of this last week. And you can see while all implant manufacturers are represented, Allergan is overrepresented statistically with comparison to the other uh, breast implant manufacturers. So if we look at uh, BioCell, compared to all other manufacturers combined, it's anywhere from 7.1 to 8.3 times greater than the other manufacturers. And if we look at what's pertinent to the U.S. market, which is Allergan to Mentor, it's anywhere from 9x to 32 times greater than, uh, Al than uh, Mentor implants. Only prospective data that we have to date is Allergan BioCell. Uh, 17,656 patients from the CARE trial. And it's important that this is prospective level two evidence demonstrating now updated eight ALCL cases out of that cohort being uh, one in 2,200. This is 
important to note um, out of Morrison Kettering, Dr. Peter Cordero, former chair of the department, as well as Ahmet Dogan, um, one of the foremost uh, authorities on breast implant ALCL, now reports out 5,700 cases, which 96% were textured Allergan Biocell, eight personal cases coming out at one in 460. It's important to note that this series is completely reconstructive, and those patients may have more genetic drivers in the general population. This is all salient information to note when you take into account that Biocell has now uh, lost it, um, did not have renewal, but CE Mark, uh, which affects Europe, and five other countries have decided to follow. So that's uh, all of Europe, Israel, Brazil, Russia, Japan, and Australia, being 38 countries uh, to date. Algen responded saying that they cited an incomplete routine review and renewal of that file. Uh, if we look at global estimates around the world, I've said just raw numbers, how many were found in each market. Australia and New Zealand has taken the extra step of getting the denominator, sales information, so that when you actually compare, you compare apples to apples. Allergan Biocell coming in at 1 in 3,300, Mentor Siltex 1 in 86,000. So based on uh, manufacturer sales difference, that's a 25.7 to 1 ratio between Biocell and Siltex. Netherlands describes 1 in 6,900 for all implants. However, Netherlands is approximately approximately a 97% textured implant market, so technically that's textured implants. The U.S. re-reported in, 1990, in uh, 19, excuse me, 2017 a rate of 1 in 30,000. I can update that to 1 in 19,000. U.S. is basically a mixed market of Allegan to Mentor, so uh, a certain proportion of 1 in 3,000 to a certain proportion of 1 in 86,000 adding up uh, to those numbers. Um, it has risen a standardized approach to this disease, comes from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, which now are advocated by both of our major societies, and 2019 guidelines are now updated in the Aesthetic Surgery Journal as of this month. I won't go into this in detail, but it now gives a very reliable way to make a diagnosis within these patients, as well as a, re a, a reliable treatment strategy based on stage of disease. <clears throat> so pathology diagnosis is made with CD30 immunohistochemistry, as well as anaplastic cells, as well as a single T cell clone on flow cytometry. All three of those must be present for the diagnosis. By that criteria, that's how we separate a benign seroma, which can be normal, from a patient that has breast implant ALCL, which is abnormal. <clears throat> if we actually look, once we have the diagnosis, and we're going to work it up with a PET CT scan, and you can see a 16 centimeter mass growing on the surface of a breast implant in this PET CT scan. We used to think that breast implant ALC was two distinct diseases. One was an effusion only, and one was an invasive mass. However, that was in 2016, based on only 19 cases. Today, at MD Anderson, we actually recognize that it's a spectrum of disease going from an effusion, infiltrating into a capsule, forming a mass, and then metastasizing to lymph nodes in rare cases. Um, for the majority of patients, they can be treated with surgery and surgery alone, which is an end block resection of the disease. And these videos just demonstrate masses growing on the surface of a breast implant, how it looks in pathology. Um, and it's incredibly important to perform the surgery and actually completely remove the disease. There in the bottom, you can see that 16 centimeter mass and the Allegan 410 implant just behind in the uh, picture. Uh, these patients were treated with surgery. Um, the top patient did require new adjuvant targeted immune therapy. Complete resection is critical because we do have some cases where partial resection um, led to uh, retained masses, and in those situations, it does have the propensity for uh, metastasis, as was seen in this patient that actually metastasized to bone marrow um, in her body. What we find is in these advanced cases, there may be uh, histological markers for an aggressive disease. For instance, in that case that I just showed you, it's one of the very few that actually has infiltration of the breast ducts. We've seen this in three patients. One of them got bone marrow metastasis, two have expired. So uh, this does seem to be an aggressive marker. 
When we look at staging of disease, we now see four different countries around the world reporting stage of disease. And what we can see is that the average is that they're all kind of clustering pretty close with the majority of patients being in effusion only and then everybody else somewhere down between. What we do feel is that surgery and surgery alone can treat approximately 85% of patients, but for about 15%, they'll, receive ad they'll need adjuvant treatment, either radiation therapy or uh, targeted immune therapy. If we look at how patients are treated, um, we see that 45% um, get radiation therapy, 60% get chemotherapy, 7% get stem cell transplant, and this speaks to that possibly patients are being optimally treated. Um, I did mention that we have deaths, and we have 19 attributable deaths to date worldwide. We mentioned that um, on the FDA website it's nine. Um, in that manuscript that we combined with the FDA, we found that approximately 13% of the MOD database was for OUS cases, and we think that that's where some of those cases are coming from, 13%. Um, we recognize five in the United States and 19, and statistically they did have a delay in treatment, and uh, none of them had complete resection of the disease. We have formed a centralized tissue repository at MD Anderson who sent over 50 specimens to uh, multiple institutions around the world. And I won't go through these in detail, but just to show you some of the research that we've done. This is a collaboration with Boston University where he demonstrated that these patients are not responding to a textured breast implant like the general population. It's marked by IL-13, IgE, and PGD-2. What did I just say? They're having an allergic inflammation to the breast implant. So they're responding in an abnormal way, creating a chronic inflammatory state on average eight to 10 years. It has been shown that uh, JAK1 and STAT3 driver mutations have been implicated. And in a collaboration that we did with Mayo Clinic, we demonstrated in 36 cases that all of them were negative for DUST22, TP63, and ALK negative. And all of them demonstrated STAT3. And so, uh, Dr. Sandler, you asked if there was any markers that we found. So we have not only CD30, but also, interestingly enough, CA9, which is only seen in renal cell carcinoma, does seem to spill into the bloodstream from this disease. Also, 80% will express PD-L1, potentially making nivolumab a therapeutic target. As yet, we have not tried. It has been uh, suggested a gram-negative biofilm releasing an endotoxin, uh, potentially chronically stimulating through a toll receptor, may be causing this T-cell lymphoma. I will point out that there is no precedence for an endotoxin leading to a T-cell lymphoma, either in a case report or in a case series, but this is an important uh, theory that's being uh, performed or uh, being pursued right now. We did do a collaboration with Northwestern University where we demonstrated in 822 patients prospectively studied that they did have a three times higher infection rate with textured implants rather than smooth implants. Not sure if that's a chicken or the egg. We did look in a collaboration with Washington University. Do they have different bacteria in ALCL patients? And we found that they did not. They are very similar to the general population, mostly marked by gram positive. Propionium bacterium and Staphylococcus, so they don't have unique microbiomes. It's been suggested by some authors that an anti infective technique would potentially lower the risk, and we were interested in this study, which was purported to be by eight plastic surgeons on a 14 year prospective series. However, it was on an anti infective strategy that was first created in 2013. Um, therefore, we looked at the intraoperative techniques of ALCL patients, and we found that if operative technique could affect risk, no strategies have yet been determined to actually lower. And so patients had received betadine, had received triple antibiotic, had received 14-point plan, and yet still could still develop this disease, which I think is an important factor. It's also been described as a macrophage particulate digestion, um, particulate actually given off the implant digested by uh, macrophages releasing inflammatory cytokines. This has been purported in orthopedic literature, 
and that those uh, cytokines then stimulate activated B cells and activated Th helper cells. We see that Th helper cells are the precursor cell for this, there's Th1, 2, and 17. And what we haven't talked about today is that there is to date nine B cell lymphomas arising around breast implants, so also possibly through this same mechanism, though I'll be quick to point out all of those were EBV positive. Is type of texturing predictive for breast implant ALCL? Well, a number of different semantics have been used to describe different types of text, uh, different types of implants. And we've seen that over the past year, biocompatibility studies are coming out saying, how does roughness and implant characteristics affect hydrophobicity, um, macrophage polarization, um, ability to, for bacterial adherence? And what we've seen is a number of different classification uh, come out. These are five different classifications coming out just in the last eight months, all about breast implants. ISO classification is probably the one most used by regulators, um, most recently updated in June of 2018. And uh, ANSM built very closely in ISO, except for uh, from the 2007 version. And we can see several peer-reviewed scientific publications on the same subject. None of these have been validated for ALCL occurrence, but what I can tell you is that there's no ALCL cases in the top row. There's more ALCL cases in the bottom row, and in the middle row, statistically, has less than the bottom row. However, I can't tell you which one best predicts for ALCL. So, in general, we try our best not to frighten patients, but to inform them. It's important to realize that this is uncommon and that it does have a very good prognosis when caught early. I would say that um, as part of surgery consent, it is important to give them the package insert. A checklist would help. Uh, ANSM did recommend black boxing um, as part of the recommendations. Um, and you may want to include that with CE mark withdrawal, it now affects biocell sales in 38 other countries, save only for the United States and Canada. Retroactive notification of patients um, has been suggested. Um, for many institutions, it is incredibly onerous and not possible. Memorial Sloan Kettering has done it, as you can see in the uh, document on the bottom. Penn State has done it as well. And for the most part, patients did not freak out. They were able to take this information and digest it in an appropriate manner. Um, and I will point out that plastic surgery is really coming together, and I'm optimistic about our grasp of ALCL. 55 authors this month published 16 peer-reviewed articles in our two major journals, and you can see that all of them talk about the major pathogenesis of this disease, risk, everything that we know on this disease right now. We are trying our best to stay ahead of this for the sake of our patients. So in conclusion, breast implant ALCL is a lymphoma based on pathology and clinical course. NCC and guidelines have risen as a standard of care for the diagnosis and treatment in an evidence-based approach. Current research focuses on determining genetically at-risk populations and stratifying inflammatory reactions to different types of texturing. So this, I've shown you a tremendous amount of data. Data is neither good nor bad. Data cannot fail us. The only way that it fails is if we fail to learn from it. Thank you.